Okay, great. We are live on time, right on time. We did great. <laughs> Welcome everyone to our monthly Azure Functions webcast. Uh, this is the webcast for the month of August. We have a bunch of goods to share, some really big announcements if you've been yeah, keeping absolutely. track of the Azure blogs. Uh, so before we get started, uh, we're all members of the Azure Functions team. We'll do a little bit of intros. We have some people who haven't had the chance to be on a webcast yet that we're very excited. Uh, so why don't you start with introducing yourself, Daria. Hi, uh, I'm Daria Grigoriou. I'm one of the PM leads for Azure Functions, and I'm uh, so happy to be here and talk to you about our latest announcement. Perfect, great. And just, it's tricky because I know you're trying to talk to them. I don't know how much they heard because you turned away from the mic. So you might have to intro again, but now look at me so that the <laughs> mic's there. <laughs> I think this must be a first that you get to intro twice. There you go, great. I, I'm Daria Grigoriou. I'm one of the PM Leads for Azure Functions, and I'm so happy to be here and talk to you about the latest announcements. Perfect, great, awesome, yes. Uh, and then I'm Jeff Holland, a PM on the Functions team as well. And I'm Eduardo. Um, I'm here, Jeff's sidekick for the webcast. Unbelievable. <laughs> Before we started, Eduardo's just complaining, and he's like, I don't have any demos. I'm not even plugging my laptop into share. Like, what's my purpose here? What am I doing? <laughs> It's okay. I, I'm here to entertain and provide comments. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, I see we've already got a lot of people who've uh, dialed in as we are live. Uh, so thank you for saying hello in the chat window. We see you. Uh, all of the seven or eight people who've said hello. Uh, so this is your chance as well. As we go throughout the webcast, share our announcements. Feel free to use the chat window uh, to both uh, tease each other if you want, but also to ask us any questions, and we'll probably grab a few throughout the webcast and then definitely at the end as well. Uh, so we'll jump right into it. Yeah, I love that um, we do this webcast and we plan then to do monthly, and we don't know exactly what are we going to announce by when, but it seems like every time we're here, there's something like new that's it's exciting true. that we can talk about. So it's like meaty. It's yeah. not like, oh yeah, we updated these docs. Here you go. This is our big exactly. update. Exactly. Like big stuff. And slowly, we feel like different contributors on the team like that have. So it's great to have Daria. Mm -hmm. I think it's your first time on the webcast. So it is. great to have you because Daria's been behind a lot of stuff, but I'm not gonna steal her thunder. That's but, right. Yeah. <laughs> great. Awesome. So we'll jump right into announcements then. Uh, so let me go ahead and share some of these announcements, and we'll be handing off kind of as we go. Uh, some of the different updates. So the first one, what's new? Daria, I think these first two I'm going to let you cover. Uh, uh, maybe I'll do them both at the same time. Anything you want to share on these two announcements? <laughs> yes. Um, so we, we've had a long journey to supporting Python in production, and uh, it's now generally available. You can do uh, production-grade workloads. We have a lot of goodies to announce. Uh, first of all, uh, we have done investments to make Python development productive. So uh, a lot of developer experience improvements. And then we um, have also made the production ready, because to have a production ready, you have to have a production hosting option. So we're also announcing uh, Linux consumption GA. Uh, so this is all ready for uh, your workloads. We're also uh, announcing the ability to diversify the way that you host. So we have now a preview for our uh, premium plan hosted on Linux. And that supports uh, both code, the same thing that you can do with uh, Linux consumption. And uh, you can also do uh, custom containers. So you can package all of your dependencies and that's uh, all new and exciting. So um, we have some uh, demos ready for you. We can do a whirlwind tour through all of these uh, uh, fun announcements. That's perfect, yeah. There's a ton of, a uh, lot of good stuff. I'll, I actually forgot one last one between Python, Linux consumption, Linux premium plan, a ton of work into this set of features uh, that we've been doing. And it, we're so excited to hit this milestone to be able to GA most of them and Linux for premium plan, uh, preview it to unlock just a whole new set of scenarios. Yeah, and, and one thing, I mean, I know a lot of you have been waiting for Python. Like, we, we got so many requests. It was our top user voice item for a while. And it's worth calling out, like, we don't go GA until we make sure, like, all the core features are working. Like, can you scale properly? Can you get the level of support that you needed? So so we we sort of take our time, but that's us like baking things and making sure features work. So you have it on the slide there, like managed identities. That's a big deal, like a real app you are gonna need like auth uh, story for that. So so really happy where we are with this. I I know long time coming, but but uh, but the quality is really good. Like 
You'd be surprised. On the Linux consumption, some of the things even work faster, but don't tell anyone. Uh, sure. <laughs> and, and getting feedback along the way, too. Like, we, we added some great features that I think you're even going to help show us. Uh, we could actually switch to that probably even right now. Uh, but I'm really excited about this milestone. I think it's a really impressive achievement. So do you want, should we just do the demos now, since that's kind of the announcements, what they're about? Sure. Great. Awesome. So I'm going to switch to Daria's screen, and she's going to show us in action some of this amazing stuff. So first, I do want to mention that uh, we have a blog post that uh, provides you with all the resources that you need to get started. We talk a little bit about the workloads um, that you might want to consider, so uh, definitely ML workloads, um, automation type of workloads are um, also a great fit. And we also talk about um, all the different hosting options um, that you're going to see in our demos. So uh, you really have a one-stop shop for getting um, started right here. So um, just to uh, start talking about um, what exactly you can experience. So first of all, it's funny that we were uh, laughing about uh, docs a little bit <laughs> because um, one of the things that we did here is uh, that we really want to have more content to get started with Beyond the Hello World. So I wanted to point out that we have some samples that are um, created um, by the um, uh, CSE partners uh, within Microsoft that work directly with customers and can distill their experience into these samples. Um, and today we're going to actually use one of them. Uh, it's image classification using TensorFlow. And we can go and uh, classify images like oh. this one. This is a little <laughs> elephant, and see, uh, it's a it's a nice uh, profile one, so it's kind of hard to classify. But this is properly trained. So um, this is my sample. You can do what you typically do, and you can go and um, run it in um, your um, Visual Studio Code editor. Um, this one uh, is basically um, initializing my um, virtual environment and starting the um, function host through uh, func host start, so using our uh, core tools. And we can um, actually go and um, validate how this is working locally first. So um, let me send a request right here. And then uh, one of the nice things, obviously, is that you can benefit from all the uh, cool features that uh, VS Code provides, like uh, debugging. So you can see here, I can inspect my variables. This is my um, input to my HTTP trigger, which is the URL. And then we can continue. And we can um, essentially observe the uh, predictions. So um, in a moment here, we can basically say, OK, we have um, our list of uh, predictions right here. and um, guess what? This was correctly identified as an Indian elephant. I knew it. I knew you were you knew it. <laughs> I, I only knew it was an elephant. So I, already I Python I, functions I, are smarter I, than me. I didn't know. I barely <laughs> knew it was an elephant. Um, so there you go. We got an answer. Now we know. Uh, some of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So now the question is, uh, what have we provided for you to make it easier to get this to Azure? So I have this uh, deployed to Azure. Uh, it's my uh, Linux consumption plan. And I can certainly uh, validate this one as well. Let's try a new image. This is a tiger. Um, it's not very suspenseful. Uh, but let's see if um, we will uh, identify this one correctly. And I should identify it as a tiger. Now, um, how did I get it here, and why is this important? It's because we have a, a new preview feature to announce. One of the pain points that we keep hearing about is Python requires server-side build. So really uh, being able to build, resolve your dependencies on the same environment that you're going to host on. And so we, we built it. We built that feature for um, doing server-side build. Uh, so um, how do you access it? Um, you can, for example, run it from core tools. And you can do um, func Azure function app publish with the um, uh, dash dash build remote option. Um, and I'm going to actually start this right here. Uh, we might not wait around until it finishes because I already showed you the app, but I want to uh, make sure that you see it in action and you have an opportunity to try it out. And um, when, you, when you do server side build means as a developer of the Python script, you need fewer things to be on your local machine because a lot of it's in the cloud. It's like, uh, how big would be like a, 
the package, what are the amount of files, what do I need locally versus what gets done in the cloud? So we do um, dependency resolution remotely, so technically um, your, your package size is drastically reduced. Yeah. Um, and also um, you get the consistency of being able to build on our very um, optimized um, build right. images right. that are up to date with um, the um, latest um, versions. Um, and we'll, we'll get into what versions we support is 3.6 and coming up yep. um, soon. 3.7 coming up soon, yeah. 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 That's right. And this server-side build one is one. I, I'm surprised. I don't know what it is about Python, but like I primarily use a Mac for my development machine. And it wasn't until I started using some of this Python stuff, even if I wasn't doing things like machine learning, just trying to like use the Cosmos SDK. Yep. It would try to pull in some cryptography library, which <laughs> the version that I got on my Mac when I published to Linux, it would fail and be like, oh, this you know, oh. native compiled, it has yeah. to be a Linux binary. Uh, and so before we kind of made people get a Docker container, create a Linux environment on their Mac, mm -hmm. on their Windows. Mm -hmm. And so just that simple flag, like the dash dash remote build or build remote uh, mm -hmm. is huge. Like it's so nice now that I'm like, okay, it works on my machine. I publish it and on the server side, the function in this optimized environment, like you mentioned, pulls all that down for me. And so stuff just works. So I, I was so excited to see that feature come, come through. Yep, and you can see here, uh, we're running the Oryx build. I'm not gonna wait for it to um, finish, but um, it's definitely something to consider trying out. And this is still a preview. Um, we're definitely happy to get more feedback. And um, customers don't don't pay for the build time, right? That's all. Nope. It's a gift from us to them <laughs> for them to use their <laughs> Python apps on, that, on Azure. Yep. And also I wanted to call out if, um, if you notice here, um, we're talking about how we store the artifacts. So we store them in um, optimized package format. And uh, to what Eduardo was mentioning earlier, that uh, optimizes your cold start. So actually, um, we have drastically reduced the cold start for uh, Python oh, on our Linux fantastic. platform. Uh, and this is one of the tricks that we use in optimizing the package format. So uh, there we go. Uh, that's the um, remote build. Now, um, we're talking about dependencies. And I, I did want to point out that in some cases, um, you might want to bring dependencies that we don't have on our images. So just um, picking an example for, um, for example, using uh, open uh, computer vision um, here. This is uh, one of the reasons why you might want to consider uh, creating some custom images. So when we talk about creating custom images, we actually have um, optimizations in place in our core tools to generate uh, Docker files that are perfectly appropriate for um, the language that you're using and the platform that you're targeting. This is all, um, all it takes, really, uh, for you to be able to create one of those uh, Docker images. And here we're um, ensuring that we are uh, doing a pip install of um, your dependencies um, from requirements.txt. And uh, once I do that with my sample, I was able to generate a Docker image. And I was able to take that and deploy it to uh, Premium, Premium Linux. So there it is right here. I have um, my, um, my URL for uh, the root of the function app. And uh, I wanted to point out another thing. Not only can you create custom container images, but when you run in premium, you can access all the other uh, interesting bonus uh, features that the platform offers. Mm -hmm. So that includes network isolation, and it includes um, higher grade hardware. So um, here, this app is um, actually set up with some amount of network isolation. We have um, access restrictions configured. And that means that um, if you're just going from the public domain and attempting to access this, you won't be able to. Nice. You will get a 403. So how do, we, um, how do we validate that this actually works from, for example, within your VNet? Um, so here we have a jump box. Um, we're connected to that. That's a VM within the VNet. And here, um, I can um, just pick a different image to make sure that you see this is live and different. Um, so if we, if we go and we uh, make a call to our function, 
then um, we see that this is correctly identified as a lion. So this worked. That's okay. awesome. There, there's, there was a lot on this demo. Like, I need to oh, comment on a few things. Like, there's one. One that I like, some developers, they just develop on containers. They just want to get that Docker file and customize it, right? As long as, and correct if I'm wrong here, as long as you do from the functions image, you can party on. You can add other stuff to that container. So that's a fully custom container. That's right. Which means you have full control over it. And what I like when you combine that with premium is, if it's your custom container, we can't optimize to pre-instantiate that container in all the VMs around the world, because we don't know what you're going to bring to us. But with premium, you can use reserved instance, have one instance always running, so that container is warm. At the time you do the first request, that thing will take no time. We just respond as if it was warm, so no code starts. So That's right. Yeah, like even stuff like ACI Azure Container Instance, where you could bring a custom container, yep. it takes like 30, 45 seconds for it to like pull down the image. Like Docker containers take a while to spin yep. up, but because with premium and the pre-warm stuff, it can be a function, it can be in a custom container, but because it's pre-warming and buffering, it feels just quick like a like a function that would, and it so scales good. out quickly. So uh, it's a ton of flexibility with this new premium offering. VNet took a function app, stuck it in a container, uh, a lot of great stuff that's worth trying out too for for some of you here who've who've been dabbling. There's also a CLI command too to get the Docker file. If you say func init dash dash docker only mm. it'll inspect even an existing project and generate a valid docker file based on the language so if you want to try one of your existing apps and like oh, i want to try out this premium thing yeah. we'll give you the docker file and then you just throw it up to a premium plan and now you're in a container and you can feel all containerized yes and that um you know not only do you have an easy way to get started but you don't have to keep track of our images you don't need to know um, anything That's really about the platform, all you need to do is just do the um, dash dash docker, and um, we will automatically manage that in our tooling to point you to the most recent and most appropriate ones. Awesome. Fantastic demo. Lots of great stuff to see. Serverless and containers, best friends, despite what people say. That's right. I know. <laughs> I still hear so much. So much. Can't we all just get along? Uh, Eduardo. Yes. Or Daria. I don't even know if there was a discussion who's covering this one. I think we decided it's Eduardo. Okay. Oh, Daria gave it to me to just talk about <laughs> That's your purpose here. You can just leave right yeah. after you finish this bullet point. And if one of you don't mind projecting um, Ahmed's uh, blog post. So oh, actually, sure. Ahmed on the team should uh, shout out. Like, he he drove this one. So we had um, site slots, probably the most or one of the most popular features on, on app service. And we've had it for a while. And that's the wa the the way you do your you sort of you ship your code uh, side by side with your production app, and when you feel like your new code's ready to go, you swap your slot with with your production. So people have been asking for that in in functions, and it was a little bit more challenging to do it in functions because functions could be scaled out massively, and how could you do that swap without you know sort of scaling down your functions? So that was the last bit of functionality, we had to learn how to do it on the team and implement. So once we did that, now that that's implemented, slots, we declared slots GA. So it would work as seamlessly as it works in app service uh, or functions dedicated, which it worked before. So, so yeah, so slots is now considered GA. So if you have production scenarios that you want to rely on slots with functions, you can now do so. so Perfect. Very exciting. Okay. Awesome. Uh, let me switch back. And now Dara can correct this. me for all the all the butchering that I might have done. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can <didn't> apply. <laughs> uh, all right. So with that, we already did the demo. So this is now where we get to share what's coming. Uh -huh. What are we working on? What's going to be the next webcast that we share? A few stuff here. We ready? Yeah. I don't think Eduardo <laughs> even knows what I put here. All right, first one. Oh, Dara, you kind of teased right. this a bit, so that's I'll let you right. talk to this one. What's the story with Python 3.7? So uh, this is um, on our roadmap for Linux consumption. It, uh, believe it or not, requires some platform magic to get working. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to um, invest in it in the coming months. <laughs> hope is, hope is right, and I'm always hesitant, but like this calendar year, we should have 3.7 yeah, yeah, live. Uh, abs and I, I should put it even more clear. In terms of what we do in Python, we just yeah, so we'll continue investing. Now mm -hmm. it's 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 really important that we keep up and 
three sevens where a lot of devs are already at. Three six is the most installed one from the numbers we've got, but three seven devs are already there. So it's we want to. It's the next most important thing for us to do in Python. But like Daria said, we want to be able to not only do three seven, but when the time's right, three eight. Not take too long to release three eight or any mm -hmm. future versions. So we're kind of doing the platform work to be able to roll out versions a little quicker. So that's sort of the the work there. So once we do three seven, we hope to be catching up with the versions uh, quicker than we do today. And also that applies not just to Python, but to the other languages exactly. that we support on Linux. So Very we definitely want to make sure that everyone gets a great experience. Yeah, like JavaScript, whichever version, JavaScript is 12, 12. now, yeah. I know, <laughs> no 12, no versions very quickly. Uh, okay, so another thing that's coming, if you have been using the premium plan, as Daria showed, you can connect to a VNet, but there's one gap right now just in terms of how we check if we should scale or not, where if you want your function app to trigger on, let's say, a storage account, and you put that storage account behind a VNet, you turn on service endpoints, Right now, when we try to decide if we scale or not, the thing that tries to decide is outside your VNet, and it gets a bunch of un, the same 403 arrows that you saw when you turn on service mm -hmm. endpoints. So we're doing work right now so that even when we're checking if we should scale or not, we can get access into your VNet. Um, so those changes just actually just recently, like as of the last 24 hours, got checked in, and they'll be rolling oh, out fantastic. in an upcoming deployment so that you can have a premium plan that triggers on a source like a service bus or a storage account or a Cosmos DB that itself is within your VNet or behind a VNet with service endpoints. You need endpoints. to configure um, service endpoints or something for this to work or you just... You, as as just soon like, as you turn on your VNet, mm -hmm. it'll work. Like right. to, to users, this is just an invisible nicety. They don't have to worry about knowing how it works. Very cool. Uh, oh, here's a big one for this group. Oh, and yeah. this is the first time I think we've actually publicly <laughs> mentioned we're doing this. Uh, we're well underway with support to make sure that Azure Functions work with .NET Core 3. Uh, we've made a bit of progress already. Uh, we hope to have some bits ready for people. I think the next step is that if you keep an eye on GitHub, uh, in the next two or three weeks, we're going to publish a roadmap based on all of our plans for when .NET Core 3 will go into preview, when it will go GA. Uh, I'm not going to tease you on dates right now, but it's a very condensed timeline. Uh, .NET Core 3 is still using .NET Standard 2. Uh, it's not nearly as big of a change as Framework to Core, so I wouldn't anticipate this takes very long at all. But it is something we're working on, and keep an eye out for updates on when you can start hitting the, the bits for the new .NET Core 3 support with Azure Functions. And, and that hints on, on a question that always comes, maybe, maybe we should talk about it, because um, we keep getting from time to time say, hey, it's great that you're doing .NET Core latest version, but I'm still on full framework. For whatever reason, you're on .NET full framework because of old legacy APIs or whatever the reason is. And I just want like sure to all of you, like we'll keep supporting that. I mean, we're adding features obviously on V2 uh, of functions, but that's fully supported until we have a story for .NET full framework on the latest version of functions. Until that happens, we'll keep supporting if you want, and you can still use .NET full framework. Okay. I just feel like saying this because we get so many questions on it, and people have yeah. anxiety. They have to make decisions of, I have a new project, full framework. Should I use functions or not? And I think you should. You, you will have ample time if we decided that um, we need to move that to a, to a newer version to, to notify you so you can make adjustments to your project plans. Agree. Right. The next one. Oh, RabbitMQ. Uh, so this is another one that's actually really far along. This is currently one of our, like I think it's our number four user voice item. So we always love checking those user voice items off. Uh, the ability to trigger on a RabbitMQ queue from an Azure function, uh, that, that's pretty well underway. I would expect in the next month or so, uh, you should have access to that. Um, so keep an eye out for that if that's a scenario you're interested in and even if you want early access to the bits or to validate what we've worked on to this point, feel free to reach out to any of us on Twitter and we'll get you connected. And that's on the Azure Functions service the, on the cloud. That's right. But you can also do RabbitMQ with KDA. You can do today. RabbitMQ yeah. today, but we don't have a function trigger. So if you yeah. do RabbitMQ with KDA, you can't have the function be the thing that's triggering Perfect. yet. Okay. All right. uh, this will help with that as well. And the last, I think this is the last one, let me make sure. Yeah, the last one is uh, performance improvements. I, we kind of do this all the time, but there's work underway uh, for pretty much every single language. There's some projects right now to just keep improving our performance, both our scaling performance, mm -hmm. our initial performance, our throughput performance. 
uh, just letting you know, like if you ever wonder what we're doing, there's always at least a good chunk of people who are just looking at performance and making sure that things are working great. Yep. Okay, anything else? Should we answer questions or go straight to community highlights? Um, I look to both of you. <laughs> I love questions. Great, let's do questions then. So we've got a few that I've been grabbing. Um, so the first one, Daria, since you love questions, this one is for mm -hmm. you. Any chance Linux consumption swap slots might be coming in the future? Uh, we prioritize based on your requests. So um, if that's something that you need, we can um, definitely start considering that. Yeah, but, but, but in general, in terms of roadmap, I think the goal for Linux consumption is just like any consumption plans to match the Windows features as, as much as possible, right? Yep. Um, with that said, we do have features like language support, so language version support. That's, that's true. So yeah. we always want to make sure that we consider the, um, the interest, and it sounds like there's interest. Perfect. Uh, for this one, let me see. Um, actually, this, yeah, he, I'll give this one to anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the answer to it, so I'll grab it if we need. So Joel asked, uh, are there any plans to make Python-based functions a target for trained ML model deployments originating from Azure Machine Learning? So right now you can deploy models mm -hmm. to AKS or ACI. Yep. Jill didn't mention recently they made it, there's a doc to publish those two app services. Mm -hmm. So his question is, is there any plans or thoughts around making functions a valid target for AML models? I think that's for you. Okay, <laughs> Dari and I are both smiling because both of us have been on meetings this week on exactly that. So mm -hmm. I don't have anything to share today, um, but yes, we're in active conversations with the Azure Machine Learning team uh, Joel even too at the same time kind of like whenever we mention we're working on something and you have an interest on it If you ever let us know it's great because we can kind of validate what we've been doing uh, But yes, we, we have been working with the Azure machine learning team to figure out. Hey, I use AML I create a model. I have my scoring logic. How can I publish that to a function? Uh, so it is something that we've been looking into Nothing to share yet, yeah. but we're working on it. It's worth commenting that s some of these scenarios really, we gated them behind the Python, the, the full Python support. We didn't want to give you something and then you can't fulfill that or not take that to production. So I think we're, we're in a better spot now to, to go and fully implement that. And also I would encourage you to um, create a user voice item if there isn't one, because the value there is not in just the votes, it's really on the comments and how you plan to use it. We learned so much from the description of what you're planning to do with that feature ask. So um, if there isn't um, enough information there, please just add yours. It really helps us. Perfect, great. Uh, so this one, this is a good one. It's from uh, an Asavari. I don't know if any of you know Asavari. <laughs> uh, I don't, I, Eduardo, I don't know if you know the update to this, but I'll do. So will we support durable functions for Python? Um, the answer is yes. She didn't ask when. <laughs> she just <laughs> asked will you support. <laughs> um, actually, there, there is um, already work underway um, internally on this um, because we do everything open source. You might even be able to find it. So, so now we need to come up with a plan to really like um, ship and support it kind of thing. So it's, so it's underway. So that's, that's real good news there. Great. Yeah, we, there was a recent kind of an internal group, a, a hackathon group that put together kind of the starting of Python for durable functions. Mm -hmm. uh, last I talked to them, they're just cleaning that up a little bit and they wanna make it an open source preview that anyone could try to help contribute to as well. Um, and our hope is that that will be a nice jumping off point to, uh, to eventually have full support. So Savar, you're welcome to, to send some PRs on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, we'll grab maybe one or two more questions and then we can come back and circle around at the end too. Um, so this one, I'll leave this open to anyone who wants to grab it. Uh, Navneet asked, is it possible to run functions in a multi-tenant scenario? For example, you wanna run the same function but have it listen to more than one Cosmos DB connection string. Does that make sense? On the same function. So same function code, but it's like it might be listening to one of 100 Cosmos DB accounts. You can, you can, you can, you can connect multiple of them. We don't support multi triggers today, right. so you can trigger multiple. But the function has to have one main trigger. Once you trigger a function, then you can manage to connect to as many Cosmos as you want from that function. So you could have something that on a timer, 
connects to a bunch of Cosmos things and does some processing sure. if you'd like to. But in terms of f that question is more about change feed to functions that it's a single trigger. Yeah, and I think the way I think, like when we talked about the VNet thing I mentioned, we have a component that goes and looks at your event source and it tries to decide are there changes. And one of the main reasons we don't allow you to deploy like a function that listens to 30 sources is because it's hard to check 30 sources to know if we should scale. So I've seen customers want to accomplish patterns like this in Neat, and usually what I see them do the most is they'll deploy the function, uh, but they'll make the connection string like an app setting like it would be. And if I have 100 Cosmos DB accounts, I just deploy 100 copies of that function and individual app settings for those 100 copies. And then we'll check each one of those 100 endpoints in the consumption plan, it's, it's not an extra financial cost to you because if only one of those things triggers, you're only going to pay for one of them. Obviously, there is a little bit more of a management overhead in that now you're managing 100 functions yeah. for 100 Cosmos DB accounts. But that's, that's the best option we have right yeah. now. The, the only other thing that comes to mind is um, sometimes you have this pattern that you need to make a decision before you dispatch work. And that's when you need an workflow, like uh, something that can orchestrate that. And that's when durable function could be the one that says, hey, let me look where there is work out of these 100 instances and then uh, kick off an activity function. So that way you're still doing a lot of parallel processing and you have the durable function kind of deciding where to send work to. So that just as a pattern, like a workflow type of pattern. Great. Uh, let's jump to community highlights because we are at the half hour mark, uh, but our viewers are still going strong. So I'm, I'm more than happy to, to come back and there's been a lot more questions that have funneled in. So keep them coming, uh, but let's just jump to community highlights and then we'll jump right back. So we always like to spend some time every month and highlight some amazing contributions we've seen from the community. I disclaim this every time, there is heavy recency bias in this <laughs> slide. Uh, and so it's very often the tweets and the blogs that I've seen in the last week uh, even though there's been tremendous content. Uh, and you're more than welcome as well to hit us up on Twitter uh, if there's like, hey, it'd be awesome if you could promote what I've been working on. Uh, and that's a great way to flag as well. So I just don't want to hurt anyone's feeling. If you've done something <laughs> awesome, feel free to let us know in the chat window too. So the first one, uh, this is one uh, Mark Diker created. Uh, it's a Durable Functions video series. Very impre incredibly produced. In fact, Mark, Mark has a bunch of awesome contributions. If you're not already following him on Twitter and you use Twitter, you absolutely should. But this video series was really impressive. He introduces durable functions. He walks through creating an HTTP durable function. It's very clear, very crisp, very high quality. Uh, so I wanted to thank Mark for that, but also point other people to it. His YouTube channel is like youtube.com slash, same as his Twitter handle. Uh, if you want to find it as well. So that's a great one. I don't know if any of you saw that floating around. I, but I actually haven't it's watched really, it yet. It's quite impressive. Very high quality. Very cool. Uh, this is one I recently saw from John Wood. Uh, I actually saw someone in the chat commenting on this one as well. And it relates to a talk that Daria actually just gave at the VS Live conference, which is that John Wood created another video tutorial, but this one was using Azure Functions and ML.NET. And in order to do that, he used some of the new dependency injection stuff. And Dari, I think you actually got something similar working for VS Live as well. Yeah, and we, uh, we were able to showcase the sample that is actually published as part of the docs. Oh, so nice. that makes it really easy to get started because really all you have to do is have a look at the sample and it walks you step by step into how you use dependency injection to integrate ML.NET. Um, and um, it's just... Um, a great experience to get started. Yeah, it's a, it's a very slick. Now with that dependency injection stuff, it's a much more natural integration point to uh, at register the ML.NET services. Uh, this one, I feel we probably plug Anthony in every, <laughs> if not every other webcast, but he keeps creating amazing content. In general, a bunch of stuff with SignalR. I just saw him tweeting today about Python, some of the Python stuff Daria was showing. He has a tutorial of doing a Python real-time web chat application powered entirely by the SignalR service and consumption Azure functions. I get impressed, like, which language does he not know? Like, he can <laughs> program true. on anything, but, <laughs> but the serverless chat's really, really slick, Anthony. Thanks, thanks for, for putting that out there so quickly. Like, we barely released, and, and there he is, like, publishing that. Yep. And creativity on the Twitter handle is where, well, I'd be remiss to not point out <laughs> Anthony Chu with the A sign. Took, I was like, Anthony Chu, but no, Anthony Chu. Uh, 
And then the last one, there was actually a number of blog posts, uh, and Eduardo flagged me on these, but if you're not familiar already, there's this concept called durable entities. I've actually seen some chatter about it in the webcast chat. Um, I've got some blog posts open here around it. This is the one I was plugging, um, but there's been this awesome post as part of the cloud blog from Rahul where he talks about using the actor model with IoT, and in order to do that, he used uh, durable entities. And so he has here, uh, I believe, yeah, this is the IoT Edge module. So he's using Edge devices as well. Uh, he's got some IoT Edge code. And then here he actually has a durable entity. Um, so I'd recommend that you check out some of those blogs. I, I've mentioned this one. Um, there was uh, this blog as well from Keese mm -hmm. that Eduardo pointed out around doing offline detection with durable entities. And again, talking about how this new pattern of these stateful entity-like functions uh, was pretty cool. Uh, I think you actually even gave me one more, uh, Eduardo, but maybe I didn't open it. But lots oh, no, of that, that's fine, yeah. What, what, what's interesting is for, for those of you in the audience is we released this, it's still preview. Um, in, in general, IoT scenarios is something where we're digging in a little deeper to see serverless IoT. What are folks doing out there? And what are the constructs we could build either on the functions programming model or in the case of durable entities, or on the platform itself to support them. So if you have feedback on serverless IoT in general, um, um, would be interesting to hear that. Actually, there's a PM on the team that's directly looking into that for now. So, so it's great. We we want to know what you're up to. But those those blog posts give real good scenarios already because you're not familiar. Absolutely. So just one last thank you to everyone in the community. Again, I see Anthony. It looks like you're online as well. Uh, huge makes a huge difference. Uh, so appreciate you sharing your learning, sharing your feedback. We, as you can tell, we all pay attention to it. We're sharing links back and forth. Uh, the last slide I have, and then we'll answer the rest of the questions. Uh, just upcoming events, in case you're in any of these areas. These are the one I might have missed some too, uh, but as we're wrapping up near the end of the year. Uh, so this week I'll be heading out to Australia to do serverless days in Sydney and Melbourne. I've got a jam-packed agenda, which I love. Uh, but if you're still interested, if I, I, I imagine I could still squeeze in some time. So if you're in the Australia area, uh, let me know. Uh, in October, there's Serverless Conf in New York that we'll be sending a few members of our uh, team yeah, out to. Yeah, a bunch of Microsoft people there, yeah. Yep. So uh, that's a great one to meet with people. At the same time, in Austin, Texas, is the Spring One Conference, uh, which will have some people who are talking about Java, Azure Functions. And then finally, the Microsoft Ignite Conference, uh, which I believe... I guess the speaking allotments haven't come out, but I have a strong suspicion that some people on this table with me may be <laughs> presenting sessions at that conference as well, yeah. uh, which the, is a nice spot. The only other one, because I know we always get Kada questions, will be at KubeCon as well, the KubeCon North America, which is in San Diego. San Diego, November like 15th or something. or something. Yeah. yeah. So we'll be at that as well. Um, and the, the one uh, Joey's going to, I just realized, the uh, Linux... There's a Linux Foundation a Conference. A Linux Foundation Conference, also, uh, to, also yeah. in line with the IoT stuff that we'll have a member of our team at. Yeah. Great. So, those are all Anything else before So yeah, if you come to the conference, come and say hi to us and, you know, come talk talk serverless. Talk serverless to us. Yeah. You should put that on a shirt. Thanks, Eduardo. <laughs> 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 all right. Back to questions. We ready? We've got a bunch. Let's see how many we can crank out in 10 minutes. Uh, everyone's, uh, I see a few people have started to trickle out, but even then, we're, we're 39 minutes in and going strong. Okay. Uh, this is a, a casual one from, I might have copied the name. It might be Illa, it might be La, I'm not sure. I, I think I copy pasted it wrong. What are the hottest topics in serverless that you are all interested in right now? Ooh. Okay. Anyone want to grab anything? Serverless uh, containers is an interesting yeah. one. Yeah. We see a lot of people who um, are interested in serverless containers either because uh, their uh, DevOps pipeline is tooled on containers and mm -hmm. they would like more flexibility with their um, options, or because of one of the points that we mentioned earlier, which is the freedom to package your own dependencies. So that's definitely something that's interesting, and we're getting to learn m much more about with um, the uh, premium container offer. Yeah, that's a huge one. I've been I've been super interested uh, in one of the things I've been really interested in is the serverless web apps. Obviously, it's not necessarily new, but I still think that it's just getting started, especially when I think about things like Blazor, Jamstack. Uh, there's still, a, I think, the way that we build and deploy a number of websites is just going to continue to evolve and change. So that's one that I, I personally have been super stoked about. 
You have any, Eduardo? Um, still interested on serverless Kubernetes kind of thing, which is an addition to the container thing. I think that's a trend. But once, it, and again, the recency bias, as soon as we release Python, I got a lot of pings on serverless GPUs. So oh, sure. how can you leverage GPUs in a serverless manner? So um, so that, again, very recent, but but it's, it yeah, we release Python. People are like, I want to process my 3D models. I want to do this complicated neural networks uh, inference and, you know, whatever, it's your default VM just can't handle it, mm. honestly. So can, can you give us more power? So, Great. so it's been interesting. Okay, a little bit of a speed round. Uh, any ETA on PowerShell GA? Um, it's one, we're, we're, we're tracking well, um, which, is, which, is, which is good. It's definitely something we want to do from now to sort of like November-ish. So we'll see the right opportunity and um, all the engineering work lines up, but but it's coming soon. Um, if you have a production need before that, ping us directly. Uh, we'll see if we can you know support you at production mode even before that. But it's one we feel really confident about. The progress has been amazing there. Great, awesome. Another one I'll grab quickly. When is Kata going GA? Uh, so since Kata isn't a hosted service, we've been using the term Kata going 1.0. Uh, Tom already mentioned a bit of this in the chat, so thank you, Tom. Uh, but the short answer is uh, we're tracking to 1.0 Kata this calendar year. Uh, we kind of have a release roadmap in that repo, as well as during our community standups we do for Kata every week. We've been talking to that. Right now we're tracking close to November. If the stars align, it would probably be very close to KubeCon. Uh, if not at KubeCon, that Kata would go 1.0. So that's what we're tracking right now, uh, but we've still got a few changes we need to make. Um, any David asks, can we share any timeline for GA of the new VNet integration uh, associated with premium plan? Uh, this in PowerShell GA would uh, unblock our pro project for complete replacement of Azure automation with functions. Brilliant. Um, I think it's all the same sort of timeline. It's it's uh, the combination of premium going GA and PowerShell going GA. And, and again, all of those, they're in motion, just to give everyone a broad timeline, all of those are things for this semester, which ends end of December. December 31st. But most of our releases, just for full like transparency here, we do it like um, uh, early December at the latest, everything's for this semester. So all of those are tracking well. So I think that would be the latest, would be very early December for all of them to come together. Great. Uh, we have three more that I have. We've been jumping through these quick, so I think we'll get to them quickly. Uh, Tom asked if they can use durable functions in a Docker container as well. Uh, the answer is yes, it works fine. The caveat I would give you for the container scenarios is durable function today requires uh, Azure storage as the generally available storage provider. There's a preview for using Redis as a backend. Mm -hmm. We've also got some work That's underway right. to explore things like Kafka or event hubs. But you can put durable functions in a container, but that container needs to be able to communicate with Azure Storage, the Azure Storage Service, to do all of the state management. So you're more than welcome to put in a container in Kubernetes, in Premium, wherever you want, as long as it can still use Azure Storage as its backend. Though something, as I mentioned, between Redis, Event Hubs, Kafka, we've been exploring pluggable storage providers where maybe you're running durable in a disconnected on-premises mm -hmm. uh, scenario. Uh, okay, la oh, two more. Any plans to add F Sharp templates to the Azure Functions core tools? I don't know if you know the status on this one, Daria. I know some about the F Sharp template work. I don't know if you know about the core tool side of this. I don't have an answer right <laughs> That's now. That's fine. That's okay. That's okay. So I know it, we did close on some .NET templates for F Sharp a few weeks or months ago. So if you use the .NET CLI, there are now F Sharp templates there, so like the .NET new, blah, 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 blah. Um, as well as some great community ones. I know Mikhail has done some pretty cool stuff with, with F Sharp and templates. Uh, this would be another one too that it's good just on like the core tools repo, user voice, to, to keep chiming on this one so that we can make sure that we're prioritizing and tracking correctly. Uh, last question, but I think uh, Anthony already answered this one, but to close it out and last call for questions, uh, any plans to let durable entities schedule a timer or a reminder similar to service fabric actors? The answer is yes. Um, I thought it was actually already there, but it must have been in an earlier proof of concept that I saw it. Uh, but there definitely is uh, work. If it's not there now, it is planned for sure. As Dan Anthony mentioned as well, to be able to say like, hey, 
remind me in a day or in six hours or in three weeks and wake me up to do something. Uh, so that's planned today. Um, I'll have to get my story straight into like, <laughs> I saw this demo, like that's why I'm, I'm like, I remember seeing a demo where there was a durable entity for a pull request and it set a timer on itself to check the pull request after a day to know okay. if it should like remind and it worked yeah. great. So maybe that code was just on someone's dev box and it hasn't yet been checked in. Okay, uh, so thank you all everyone from the community. Thanks everyone for being active in the chat, for sticking with us for 45 minutes with our monthly update. Stay tuned, follow us on Twitter. If you wanna know when the next webcast is gonna be, we'll do one in September. Uh, and then October, November, December. I don't need to go on from there. Uh, <laughs> please keep contributing. Reach out to us through user voice, through Twitter, through GitHub. Absolutely. Uh, we really love working with this community. It's so fun to see the amazing content that's produced and the amazing people we get the chance to work with. So, Excellent. great. This has been, this has been really good. Jam-packed. Okay, yeah. thanks everyone. Go try okay. out that uh, new announcements, Linux, Premium, VNet slots, you got it. Uh, and we'll talk to you all next month. Thanks so much.